All right, folks, we are back on the set of PBS Book View Now. This is BookCon 2016, and I'm with Lee Bardugo, who's one of the stars of the show because this book that's coming out, Crooked Kingdom, the second in your series, highly sought after. Everybody's asking questions about it. I'm excited about it. Yeah, yeah. it's been Welcome. very exciting. Thank you. Yeah, last year we had you as a guest host. You were so gracious and joined us for a full hour. I said, I'm coming. I mean, we got to have you back. Because I'm glad. The new one's here. Let's talk a little about the Grishaverse and the new book in this series. You know, the, the first one, obviously, Six of Crows, which everyone has been playing with it's today. got a beautiful it was packaged yeah. beautifully beautiful yeah. package hard to avoid uh the second one crooked kingdom comes out september 27th yes and it takes us back to ketterdam yes and other areas but talk to me uh, a little bit about where we're going with the second one we talked a lot about the heist element of the yeah. first yeah the first book is very much a heist book and the second book is very much a con book, okay? So it's got some heist elements, but um, it's sort of deception within deception within deception. And it's really a revenge and redemption book. Like all of these world powers are descending on Ketterdam um, in search for, of this drug and information on this drug, Jodaparam, that could unleash magical havoc on the world. So Kaz's crew is at the center of it. and. You know, they still have some personal issues to work out. This is a group of people who, who don't trust easily and for good reason. Um, and they also have a lot of demons that are coming home to roost and that they're all going to have to grapple with to get to the end of this. So, yeah. yeah. Talk about this drug that can wreak <clears throat> the havoc. Like, yes. I want to know more about this and how it all, that all works. Um, okay, so Jurda Param is, uh, it basically takes, the Grisha are the magic wielders in my world. And there are very strict rules for how that magic works. Um, when I was writing the first trilogy, the Grisha trilogy, which you don't have to read, to read Six of Crows, but um, I wanted a magical system with very strict rules so that um, the advent of modern warfare could really be a serious issue. Like if you, you know, if you say, you know, what happens when you bring a gun to a magic fight, right? Nothing happens if there's no rules on the magic. So um, I had really constrained Grisha power. And then when I started this new series, I wanted to take Grisha powers to 11, essentially. Like I wanted a chance to level them up. And that's what this drug do. It does. It basically like blows the doors off. And Grisha can do things that they were never, never able to do before. So a fabricator who could like before make like a really nice sword with a very fine blade can now basically like create an earthquake and like throw you up. <laughs> in the air and yeah. squalors who could control storms can now fly and um, heart renders who could, you know, they could stop your heart without ever laying a, like a hand on you. Yeah. Now they can actually change the way you think. Like they can actually control your thoughts and control the impulses in your brain and they can decimate an entire army, just one person on this drug. So yeah. um, the idea of it having in the hands of a single government is pretty scary. Yeah. Now, the, now the, the first three in the Grisha trilogy with yes. three books started with Shadow and Bone. This was a, always meant to be a two book series. It is a two book series. How do you wrap everything up in one book and how much pressure was that to think about closing the loop on so many of those storylines? You know, I had this ridiculous idea that writing a duology would be easier than writing a trilogy and that is a lie. Yeah, like, you could take a break in the middle is, and just stretch things out. Stretch things out. You can go to another country. Yeah. You can have some nice meals. Like, you really have to get a lot done in that second yeah. book and There's that's no why time. it's much longer. Um, I also added a POV. If people have read the first book, Wylan is the only character who doesn't have a POV but he does in, in Cricket Kingdom. Book. Yeah, yeah, we learn a lot about him. So you added another POV. That just complicates matters for you. That's like one of the things that you do. You're juggling so many POVs, mm -hmm. this massive world that you've constructed that, that lives, both, all the books all live in the same Grisha universe. Mm -hmm. All these POVs. How do you keep it all straight as you're writing it? You know, I think the biggest challenge is, is getting the voices to really sound distinct. And that doesn't happen until the later drafts. And I think that can be incredibly uncomfortable for a writer, or at least it is for me, when I'm working early on because um, nothing feels right. The draft doesn't feel right when those voices haven't settled in, but it takes the revision for me to really hear them the way they're supposed to be heard. That takes experience to know that. Yeah, I think so. A confidence that you're going to somehow eventually find your way there. Well, I don't think Six of Crows could have been my first book. I don't think I had the chops in terms of craft. and. Um, and I don't think I don't think I would have had the confidence to see the story through. Like you're, yeah. you're right. It's it's very much knowing like okay, I just have to keep at this, and it's going to find the way there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I get a lot of questions from younger writers who are saying, you know, how do I make the voices distinct, and or how do I um, how do I make this plot work, or all of the, you know all of these details, and it just doesn't all happen at once. Yeah. And a big part of being a writer, I think, is living with the discomfort of feeling like you're failing yeah. and just powering through that to the point where you fall back in love with the story. Yeah. Let's talk about Kaz a little bit in the con. Mm -hmm. um, 
clearly the leader of the of the crew. Um, you know, a lot of people love to compare your books to Ocean's Eleven, but this feels more like the Sting to me. You know, mm. kind of going back into the '70s where the big con is underway. Yeah. Um, talk about the switch between heist and con, and what that meant as you were thinking about it. I mean. You know, in, in some way, a, a heist to me is not radically different from a big battle scene, right? You're moving towards this big third act moment with moving pieces, and the only thing that really is different from a massive battle scene or a massive third act moment is that in the heist, you need to have a moment where the reader believes that everything has gone to hell um, and where the characters, at least, are going to pull a turnaround. You need that moment of the switch. Um, so it's a question of revealing information. The con is, you know, the reader is in on a lot of it from the beginning. So the twists and the reveals come a little bit later. Yeah. It's also just kind of fun because um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say, you know, we know from Kaz's past that he was conned as a kid. He and his brother um, were, were conned and lost everything um, because of one of the antagonists in this book. There are many antagonists. There's still revenge factor. <laughs> there's a here. very strong revenge factor. And also, like, how far do you go before you become the thing you most despise? Like, right. uh, that's a long-running theme. Um, uh, but it's definitely is something that Kaz has to grapple with because you cannot play, you cannot play by, you cannot be a decent human and succeed in Ketterdam. You cannot. Um, and yet, Kaz has this pull towards decency because of this, these feelings he's having for another character. So um, he's really wrestling with that in yeah. this book. But he's pretty horrible, and I really enjoy writing it. Well, these characters are all sort of problematic. They, some of them are horrible. Some of them are un unlikable in that really likable way. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're not good, in other words. No. I mean, they have, like, they have they're bad people, but yet you like them and you want them to win and they all have redeeming qualities, obviously. That's why we're rooting for them all. Yeah. But talk about that, of turning it on its head and like being sort of energized by that, that type of character. You know, the Grisha trilogy was very much a chosen one story, right? You know, it was uh, very much people trying to do the right thing for their country, for humanity, um, and it was sort of more class classical fantasy in that way. With this story, I really wanted to tell the story of six kids who are not chosen ones and who don't have grand destinies and who are not working towards the greater good. And some of them have more noble goals. Like Nina um, is very much a patriot and really wants to protect her people. So that's something that even though she chooses to pursue some avenues that are maybe not um, necessarily moral, we understand that. Um, and Nej has <clears throat> been forced into this situation where she's had to become a killer. Um, if she wanted to survive, and she has chosen to, you know, live freely as a killer rather than quietly as a slave. Um, but everybody is kind of grappling with these things, and for me, that's very exciting because I think in our lives, we very rarely have clear-cut moral decisions. You know, we are always trying to factor in a lot of different things, and um, hopefully, it doesn't lead us down the path of like murder and mayhem. But uh, we have, we're always weighing more factors than sometimes fiction gives us credit for. Yeah. yeah. All these themes that you get to grapple with and think about, and that really, I, I'm sure, are fascinating for you as you're writing it to really sit back and ponder and think about. It's a huge world that you're walking around with in your head, the entire yeah. Grisha universe. Um, and it's now five books, and there's lots of other things in there. Yeah. Like, how do you juggle all that? Where does it all live when you're not writing? And um. does things, you know, it has to just like sort of peek out and when you're just out to dinner at, at some nights. Um, I mean, that's sort of the best thing is when, when you're occupying. I mean, when I'm on deadline, I don't go out to dinner. I don't leave the house. I don't do anything. I live in my pajamas, and I inhabit that world as fully as I can. Um, and those decisions, those choices, that entire environment becomes um, very real to me. Um, and, then, and then I don't want to see it. I don't want to look at it for a while, and it really vanishes. And it's only when it starts creeping back um, when I'm out with friends or I'm going someplace and I think, oh, I just had another idea. You know, I can, oh, well, maybe we'll go to this country and maybe we'll, maybe this character is going to get his own story. Um, and, but that makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I built something that is kind of like a long-term love. Yeah. It wasn't just a fling. Like, it's something that I can, I can come back to again and again if yeah. I want to. Yeah, so within the Grisha universe, you've got Ravka, you've got mm -hmm. this sort of Russian-inspired yeah. um, land, and then you've got Ketterdam, which is more Amsterdam-ish, but maybe more. Tell me where Ketterdam came from. Ketterdam is really a lot of places. It's definitely heavily influenced by Amsterdam. And all of Kerch is inspired by um, the Dutch Republic of the 1700s, which maybe doesn't sound that sexy. Are you a history buff? I am a history addict. Like, yeah. I, that is More my favorite thing to addict. read. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like, I love stories, and that's what history is, you know. So um, 
so yeah, so uh, Kerch is kind of like the anti-Ravka. Like Ravka is very old world. It was very isolated uh, for a long time from trade and from contact with the outside world. Whereas Kerch is like this hub of international trade. Um, it's it's like this little island superpower. So it's a little like you know um, the the British Empire. Um, it's very much like uh, what the Dutch Republic was in the 1700s. And it's very cosmopolitan. It's very wealthy, very prosperous, very like hyper capitalist. And I wanted to create this world where, you know, Ketterdam is this city where anything can happen. It's a little bit Las Vegas, it's a little bit Victorian London, it's a little bit old New York, New Amsterdam. Um, so you have this incredibly like gritty world that is full of prosperity, but that also has this thriving criminal underbelly. Yeah. Um, and I, that's, I want to yeah. go there. I don't know if you want to go there. <laughs> it's very I dangerous. Do. I know, Pack it, sounds, your knives. it sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, now that you uh, have, have, are putting the final touches on Crooked Kingdom, mm -hmm. and that's going to be in the world soon, do you come back and go back to another land within the Grisha universe, or are you going to leave for a while and do something different? I has, I'm actually working on the um, Wonder Woman adaptation, right. where I'm doing a YA Wonder Woman. Heard all about that. Yeah. I'm thrilled <laughs> for I'm that. I'm very edition. excited for that for uh, Random House in DC. And um, I actually have some plans for some new Grisha books and something that is completely outside of the Grisha world that I've been working on for a long time is kind of a little dream project for me. So we'll see really? what happens and with it. You're not going to yeah. tell me anything about it, are I'm you? I'm afraid to talk about it because I haven't gone out with it yet. Like only my agent knows about yeah. it and I'm afraid I'll jinx it. But it's a dream project. It is it You've is literally it one of while. the first ideas I pitched to Joe when I first signed with her. Well let me ask yeah. this look then. We, you don't have to tell me anything about it, even though okay. of course you're gonna you know if you slipped up and said something that would be nice. <laughs> but but even so when you have one of those early projects that are in your head and it's not time to write it or it can't happen for whatever mm. reason how do you think about that? Do you put them in the shelf and leave them, or are you always kind of gnawing to get back there? I, if I, I mean, I have like these, like, like, like this long list of voicemail files or voice messages to myself mm -hmm. um, talking about ideas, and occasionally I go through and I just have like an idea file that has little, little bits and pieces. It might even just be dialogue. But when it's a story that, I mean, this is a story that caught hold of me very early on, and I didn't, Again, for me, it doesn't come fully formed. Um, right. Six of Crows was kind of an exception, you know? It's like, I'm gonna write a heist in the Grisha verse. Okay, boom, there it is. But um, everything else, you know, you, you have to find the right story for the right world and bring the characters together. And actually, even some of the characters from Six of Crows were characters that I had thought, oh, maybe I'm gonna write a novella for them. Like, that, maybe that would be a good romance or that would be a good short story. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm gonna bring them together on this crew. They're gonna have to work together. Um, and so, like, this particular idea was cooking for a long time, but, um, I, I mean, I guess the one thing I can, well, no, I'm not going to say that. Oh, almost. I, I, we almost um, had it. We almost had but, it. But uh, it is set in our world, yeah. um, as opposed to being high fantasy. And I think um, there might have been some hesitancy in me as well, because it's a little bit of a departure. Right. But, but I also just did a short story for Stephanie Perkins for Summer Days and Summer Nights. Very nice. And that's set in upstate New York. It's a sea monster love story, as you do. And, um, <laughs> and that was so fun for me. And I really love the idea of building magic within our world. Like, any time you had that secret level of right. things that are happening um, beneath the surface. It makes me feel so much more like magic could be real, and that's really all I want from yeah. this world. Well, I'm very excited about all the things you mentioned. Can't wait to find out what these magic secrets are. Cool. In the meantime, Crooked Kingdom, September 27th, so yep. much excitement for that. Lee Bardugo, you're having an amazing run right now. Thank you. Less to continue. So Thanks good so to much. See you yep. again. I really appreciate you being here. 